Network Automation Nerds Podcast. Hello and welcome to Network Automation Nerds Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cho. Today on the show, I'm super excited to be talking to Nick Russo. So Nick, I would consider him to be somewhat of a renaissance man. I mean, besides being CCDE, twice the CCIE, and a technical leader at Cisco. He's also a author, a course instructor, and active on social media, voicing his opinion on a lot of different issues, as well as helping others. Um, I probably missed a title or two, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit. And um, amongst other topics, today we'll be talking to Nick about his personal journey on networking engineering in general, as well as building an ethical and profit profitable site business. I'm super excited to have Nick on the show today, and I know I will learn a lot of things and hopefully we'll pick his brain and could help you in your own journey. So hello, Nick. Welcome to the show. Hi, Eric. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to, to come on and share my experiences with everyone. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're you're compared to me, you're uh, at all hands at this. So I'm just uh, I'm just a noob at this. But hopefully, we could you know uh, take enough time, uh, do enough talking and topics, and um, cover enough stuff that to help others as well. Yeah, I think so. We're do obviously this is a little bit different than some of my other interviews because we're we're talking <laughs> about different topics. So hopefully, it'll be interesting for the listeners. Yeah, you know, I think this is a topic that has always in interested me uh, for a number of years, and we could we'll go into a little bit. But I think it's important for people to find their own voice, as you have done in you know trailblazing this way, and you know by sharing your experience, you know others could do the same as well, because we're all company of one <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> so, um, so Nick, you know, you have quite a uh, a diverse array of interest we talked about books and you know obviously network engineering computers in general so i'm wondering can you tell us a little bit about how you know you got started what uh, got you interested in technology yeah so initially you know I, I really probably the first thing that got me interested is when i started taking computer science in high school and the program that i was in um it was required for everyone so whether you wanted to do computer science or not, you did it for all four years of high school. And that started in 2000 for me. So oh, there no were some kidding. people, yeah, there were some people who, you know, no, none of us really knew what it was. I mean, year 2000, <laughs> you're 14 years old. What is computer science? Everyone's like, oh, I'm, you know, we think it's like physically building computers and stuff. It's that's not really what it is. Um, right. But, you know, there were people who were more, you know, social studies, English type you know, less technical people that were forced into it and they absolutely hated it. And then there were other people who were more technically inclined, you know, people who were, you know, the math, I'll call it math and science type people from middle school who enjoyed sure. it. And I happened to be one of those people. So I, I did really well in that for four years. I uh, went on to study computer science at, at the Rochester Institute of Technology for four more years, earned a, a bachelor's in computer science in 2008. Um, and I enjoyed that kind of work. I enjoyed writing software, but right. I was, but there were two things that were that are interesting to note is that I didn't absolutely love it. I liked it, but I didn't love it. I knew I could do it for a career and that's fine. Um, and in addition to that, uh, I wasn't great at it. Like I was, I liked it and I was good at it, but I didn't love it. And I wasn't great at it, if that makes sense. So yeah. I wouldn't call it a passion per se. Like it was something I was good at. I would have been a, an acceptable developer on any team. I was able to get things done and I was respected right. by my teammates, but I absolutely was not the best guy, not by a long shot. That's um, kind of interesting because I'm oh, sorry to cut you off. No, 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 no. That, that, is, no, that is so interesting because I mean, when you hear other people's journey, some of them is like, oh, my, my dad got me a computer at five and I sold my first computer game and just fell in love with it. Right. And then, and then right. there's other people who was like, oh, you know, I started really late, but I, I certainly excel at it. But you're somewhere in between where, you know, you 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 know what it was and you kind of, you know, you were good at it, but doesn't mean you need to do it for for, you know, work and do it for food. Right. Yeah. And there was another complicating wrinkle is that while I was in college, I was also in the Marine Corps as an infantryman and a reservist. Mm. And when I finished college, I accepted a commission and became an officer and then went into communications. So, yeah. and I knew in the back of my head, kind of subconsciously, I knew that was going to happen. So no matter how good, you know, like when I got out of college, other people were looking for jobs and I wasn't because I had, right. a job, you know, right. and I didn't need to look. Uh, and I knew that I wasn't going to be doing software development for some time. And when I went to the Marine Corps and I 
uh, identified that I wanted to be a communications officer. Unfortunately, I was able to get that job. Right. Uh, a lot of people didn't want that job. And when I when I went into that role, I realized that in addition to the very military specific technologies of it, like working with field telephones and tactical radios, there was a very big component, which was IP networking. And that was right. relatively right. new. Uh, you know, I say relatively new um, because at that point, the military didn't have a ton of equipment that did that kind of thing. Uh, this right. was in 2008, 2009. So it was still relatively new. And uh, no one really knew it well. Um, to have a CCNA meant you were like the top guy, you know, so there weren't <laughs> like there wasn't like a huge brain trust. Right. And I got really I got into it, even though I was not very good at it. While I was in Afghanistan, uh, I saw Marines under my command who were very good at it. Uh, at least relatively, relative to the rest of the unit, they were very good at it. Sure. Uh, and I was like, this stuff is really cool. So I really enjoyed networking. This is something that I was not good at, but I really enjoyed. And when I got out of the Marine Corps, the rest is kind of history. The next several years, I became an expert in multiple areas of networking. And that's what I really enjoyed. And what really kind of came around is when network automation started becoming bigger and more popular, I saw that as a way to tie in two things I really enjoyed, which was networking and software. Now, I never really had an interest in being a full-time developer, as I said before, because I was never right. great at it. But if I right. can be an app, if I can be a world known expert in networking and be above average in software development, I think I can combine those two things together and be pretty good with network automation as well, which is another thing that I can do for training, another thing I can do for consulting projects. Um, I do a lot of this work within Cisco, which has brought in a lot of new revenue for my department. So there are a lot of advantages to combining those things together. And I know I'm not the only guy to say this. There are a lot of other people who have expertise in networking. Um, uh, Jason Edelman is probably the most prominent example at Network to Code, you know, had yep. expertise in networking, uh, got into network automation very early, like seven or eight years ago, and started a, a large company off it. Now, now look what now now look where that is. You know, there are there are many others in the same boat. So I'm by no means unique. Um, but by being able to combine those skills uh, is ultimately a really it's a really um not only is it like profitable from a money perspective, but it's also very satisfying. Yeah. So have you have you thought about what interests you the most? Because that, that was a lot to unpack over there. So I want to, you know, go back to what you said about you found your passion for networking. What interests you the most that you say, this is it, this is what I'm gonna do for life over, you know, something you were good at, which was both uh, in the Marines and uh, as well as uh, computer science. I think I think what did it for me is that networking was like completely what I did. So when I was in Afghanistan, that's like for for eight months straight, yeah. making sure that the network was working was all we did twenty four seven. That was like the only thing that mattered. I mm -hmm. mean, we had you know radio and telephone and other things. Those are pretty stable. Those are technologies that are thirty years old that are great, and it's great because they're extremely stable and reliable, yeah. and that's what you need. Um, right. But the data networking was newer. It was more technically complicated and it was more prone to breaking. And we weren't even that good at it. Imagine 50 people trying to maintain a network where maybe two people are C CCNA level and everyone else is worse. Right. And then that's and that's what you're working with. Now, it doesn't mean they were bad people. They were all brilliant and extremely hardworking. Um, and we, we managed to overcome every problem that befell us. But looking back at it now, I'm pretty sure every single person who has increased their skills in the, in the past 10 years is like, Oh, I would have done all these things differently. And that's just hindsight. <laughs> um, but, but the thing for me is that every single day working with it, troubleshooting the problems, fixing it, and even standing up new sites and adding new links to build redundancy. I really enjoy that process. And in the military, there's lots of other equipment. It's not just here's an ethernet handoff, plug it in. There's radio systems and encryption devices and media converters. There's all this other equipment in between that you're mm -hmm. responsible for everything end to end. There's no magic service provider. It's all you and your gear. Um, and as the, as the officer in charge, I was responsible for everything, not just the equipment, but you know, everything from powering and cooling and cleaning and maintaining the equipment, supplying personnel to do the install, the the operations administration and, and maintenance of it, all that stuff um, ultimately fell under me. And right. I got to see what it took to manage a network um, that was completely stood up from the ground. Like we, we had switches that were completely full of sand and we had to take them apart and canned air. Like that was just part of the maintenance cycle that we had. And it was really interesting because, um, these were, this was a technology I only had a basic understanding for, but I knew I really enjoyed it because I saw the applicability for enterprises, for carriers, for tactical networks and everything else. 
And then, of course, when I left the military, I went and did military related contracting work on networking because I mm -hmm. started to learn it really well. Right. And I really enjoyed doing that kind of work, too, because it allowed me to take a lot of my skills and experience and package them into something useful for customers. Yeah. So I I could totally identify with that. The first thing that kind of interests me in networking was just the end to end. You never you know, it, it's it's good for a developer just throw over the code over the over the fence and say, you know, uh, I imagine this as a as a, a imaginary fiber or Cat five cable at the time, right? <laughs> Going from my desktop and just to to my uh, destination or or viewer or whatnot. But it's another when you're responsible for the end to end connectivity and you actually know at every single hub what happens. I mean, it took me years to learn, but of course, you know, you were responsible for the end to end uh, communication, and that kind of drives your interest. And of course, you also mentioned, you know, the uh, the military network has its own uh, challenges. I remember going to fiber classes with um, some of uh, some of the students being military based, and they were talking about like how can you fuse a fiber in a sandstorm, right? <laughs> so that kind of goes in line with what you were talking about. The switch is full of sand, um, and uh, you know, just th that's just part of your daily life, your forward deployment, and so on. Um, do you want to go a little deeper into what kind of specific challenges? I know you mentioned, you know, uh, end to end is uh, there's no special carriers or service providers, also security requirements. So do you want to just dive that a little deeper into what are some of the unique, you know, challenges in the military network that you faced and uh, like you said, overcome? Yeah, there's in, in our specific network. I mean, there, there's kind of two two ways of looking at this. There's, you know, in when we were there, our network was relatively small in that it was only like less than 10 sites and was relatively fixed. You know, the links were kind of like point to point radio type connections um, mm. without a whole lot of mobility. Uh, and that's different. It depends on, you know, different units have different mobility requirements. But in, in any event, you know, the challenges are these links are going to be a lot slower than what you're going to see in a fixed trillion dollar infrastructure, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're going to be uh, more, they're going to have lower availability, so they're going to break more. So resilience becomes a bigger factor. Um, quality of service becomes a bigger concern because, you know, somebody reporting, you know, their their food and ammunition stores in a, in a big PowerPoint that's two, you know, that's 20 megs. That's a lot less important than the five kilobytes of, um, you know, data for air support or something like that, you know, so I won't get too much into the operations, but I think you get the idea is that there can be lots of, um, there's a lot of administrative stuff, you know, people joke about uh, like in the army, you know, you might know that some people have uh, like for special forces that they say the word tab, like a ranger tab that you, you know, you have this special accomplishment. Uh, right. We don't do that in the Marine Corps really, but in the army they do. And they talk about having like a a PowerPoint Ranger tab is a joke <laughs> because when they were overseas, they did so much of that. And that's how they, that's how they fought their fights. Um, right. And that's, that's true for the Marine Corps too. Um, and the, the my, my point with all this is that it's not that much different from a regular enterprise, the PowerPoints, the emails, the, the calls, those kinds of things, the VTCs, those are pretty common. The difference though, is that there are other military specific applications. The QoS becomes more complicated because all the links are slower and lower availability. And of course, the security requirements mean that, you know, typically when you transmit data over an untrusted medium, which includes the air for radio, which includes a commercial carrier, or even if you just run a cable, like a really long cable between two sites, um, if you don't have physical control over every centimeter of that cable, um, then you need to, uh, you know, put some special encryption on it. And there's very specific regulations that govern how that needs to be done. And, that, and those devices are relatively dumb in that they don't have a lot of features. So it's not as easy as just doing a, a Cisco router to Cisco router IPsec tunnel with all the features that comes with it. You're very limited on the things you can do, and that governs your whole network design. So the yeah. challenge, there are all kinds of network design challenges that arise from that. That's a good point because... You know, yeah, it's it's a little things, but um, combine them, they just magnify each other, right? Like you said about slow link, yeah, that by itself you could overcome, but couple that with your encryption requirement and um, uh, end to end, you know, whatever other requirement that's that's you know enforced upon you, maybe just the the uh, under the weather, the nature of uh, just the environment that you operate under. So those kind of compounds each other, and they become a huge problem. So I would say the first time I came across your uh, 
uh, your content and your personality was through one of the podcasts you did on specifically about the requirements for for military. So we'll definitely include show notes. I would encourage people to go back and and listen to that if you're interested in uh, in that aspect and and Nick's perspective. So after the military, you went out and become, like you said, an expert in multiple fields of uh, Cisco certification and uh, become CCIEs and CCDs. So for people or audience who's not familiar with those certification, can you just dive a little bit about what CCIE is, what CCD is, and um, how you got there, like kind of your background in getting those certifications? Yeah. So without without the whole story, because, you know, and, and everyone can tell a one hour story on every CCIE they get because it's a whole emotional roller coaster. But to summarize it, you know, that the CCIE is a really difficult implementation test where you get this lab and you get all these tasks and you're asked to do all this complicated configuration to test out all these features. Uh, so, you know, that's a really generic way of saying a complex network that you have to implement and troubleshoot and diagnose problems in, and Cisco is testing your ability to do that. And the test is kind of two faceted in that there's a lot of protocol knowledge that you need to have, like how do these different routing protocols work? Uh, and that's a general skill, but you need to be able to apply those skills specifically on Cisco equipment. So it's not so much of a memorize all these commands. It's more of a show me that you understand OSPF by configuring it on this complex network that just happens to be all Cisco. And right. even after earning CCIEs, when I was presented with a Juniper device or an Alcatel device or whatever, yeah, I didn't know the commands and I was a little bit slow, but it didn't take me very long to say, okay, hey, John, can you show me how to how to investigate the OSPF database, just what show me the base command and I can question mark through it. And then within a few minutes, I'm able to do everything I would normally do. Um, the CCIE just makes sure you know how to do that offhand on Cisco gear, but that protocol knowledge typically will carry over to some extent. And this right. is different than the CCDE. And I think a lot of people, typically CCIEs <clears throat> who have experience, who are interested in the CCDE don't really understand this, is that this test is very, it's much less Cisco specific and it's not an implementation test for the most part. You'll never be asked to type a command. There's no command line. It's just scenarios that you walk through. So you get a picture of a diagram. You'll get some, uh, you know, basically scenario emails from your, one of your clients and they'll say, hey, I have requirements A, B, and C. What design would you recommend? And you have to choose, you know, which design makes sense. And then after each choice, you'd be asked to rationalize it and explain why did you pick this choice? And you need to explain why that was the right answer. Hmm. Uh, sometimes they'll give you a list of requirements and it's incomplete. And then the test will ask you what additional information do you need to continue? And those right. are tough questions because when you read those answers, all five of them sound like good answers. You know, <laughs> so it's like you got to pick <laughs> which is the one that you specifically need to answer the question, not simply what's nice to have. Yeah. It's a very tough test. Um, I personally found the CCDE to be easier than CCIEs oh, because, no um, yeah, and it's kind of rare, but the reason is because I'm, I, I, I I'm kind of a, I guess the right word is skeptical. I, I'm a little bit of a skeptical guy by nature. So when I'm reading through this design, a lot of people I think fall into the pit of best practices. And if you only know best practices, you will absolutely fail that test. Right. Um, you need to be willing to do a little bit more thinking outside the box. And I'm not saying that people who fail CCI DE are not creative. That's not what I'm after. I'm only saying that um, if you're presented with a complex routing problem and one solution is to use BGP with communities and the other solution is some ungodly redistribution design, don't dismiss <laughs> the second one out of hand right. because you need to go back and read the requirements and you need to think, what are they testing me on? Why would they present me such a clearly crazy solution? But upon further reading, you may find that it's the better one given those requirements. And it, yes, it's a little bit unrealistic for some people. But the goal of the test isn't testing your memorization of best practices and standards. It's testing, did you read what the customer requires and can you deliver a solution to satisfy those needs? Um, and I a lot of people that, struggle with that. Right, right. No, I could um, I could relate to what you were talking about for CCIE. I mean, um, it really tests your knowledge about uh, not just the best practice, but also why you're doing this. I remember you know, when I, when I took my exam, that was the only time I would ever configure like odd, a, uh, an access list that matched the odd number of subnets or just the even number of subnets. On the face value, you might say, oh, this would never happen. And 
what the heck am I doing this? But yeah, but it forces you to think about like the binaries behind it and why you're doing it, and that translates good. That translates into other vendor network, like you said. You know, when you're faced with maybe some of the other vendor network, you may not know the syntax, but you absolutely know the um, the underlying binaries behind that or whatnot. Your BGP, your OSPF、uh, database. So that that absolutely.、Uh, Echo hundred percent what you said, you know the CCDE. Interesting, you mentioned it was easier for you, and I know you have a, a book on this、um, that you published, and、uh, just to help others. But、um, but what in? Well, I never went for a CCDE. You know, I got my IE, and that was a few years after CCDE came out. A few years after,、um, but by that time, you know,、uh, you know, I would just move on a different track. But、um, but yeah, what what kind of intimidated me was. I thought maybe I'm wrong on this, but it was kind of subjective, right? Because it's design, so there's no right or wrong answer. You're being judged by some other people on what that good design was. And you mentioned about you know reading the the, the questions and and being clear about the objectives. So、uh, so maybe I was wrong. You know, I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, this is a it's a common misconception because design in general is a subjective thing, right? Kind of. But in the test, they do a really good job of if you if you go and you read all the documents and the requirements, there is only one answer. Like if、mm. they say, you know, which routing protocol will solve this problem, and they can give you five choices, and they would all technically work, but there's、right. only one that would meet the customer's requirement.、And、that's what makes the test particularly hard. So there's no,、um, I think it was like this in the early days where there was like a free answer. There's none of that. It's all multiple choice, drag and drop, you know, check boxes. So there's no, you know. There's no person that gets to voice their opinion. It's you got it or you didn't, which is fair,、yeah. I think.、Um, but yeah, it's not. It's it's less subjective because, you know, in real life, you know, you might say, yeah, I'm going to add in these other features because future growth, and I, I've known this customer for ten years, and they're going to want this. You need to push all that to the side because、mm. this is a scenario. You're taking a test. Don't pretend like you understand this customer's long culture, and don't. Assume that they're going to want things in the future. Give them exactly what they want and no less.、Um, read all the documents that they gave you, and you'll shouldn't have a problem with the test. I mean, I finished you know, an hour early. Passed oh wow! The <laughs> yeah, like it was not. It was hard, but it wasn't that hard. CCIEs、right. were harder for me. Oh, interesting. I mean, I think you know just just because we're talking about this in a in a back to back fashion, I think your marine experience kind of help you with that, right? As a as a tactical officer. That you're you're kind of responsible for just sorting out. Hey, here's my situation. Here's what I have, and what do I do with it? There's no,、uh, you know, looking forward, looking backwards. You just have to have,、uh, you know, sort out your requirements, know what you have, and act fast. Yeah, that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good way of looking at it. And you know, it's interesting. You said you can't look backwards because you actually can't go backwards in that test. So it's like, <laughs> like a CCIE where you can just scroll up and check everything. Yeah, like next, it's it's like a regular. Regular Pearson test, like you can't go back. So, yeah, it's it's very, and you have to manage your time. Like all those things come into it, and you you need to be decisive, but also you don't want to be impetuous. So, yeah, push through it.、Um, but at the same time,、um, it's it's one of those things where if you're if you're good at reading, and you're good at especially if you're good at reading between the lines on things,、um, and especially work, working in the military and then going into government contracting, there's a lot of, shall we say. Corporate politics and corporate theater, and when the you get good, at, yeah. When when you get good at decoding that, and you get、yeah. good at reading between the lines, and you and you, you know, because sometimes in these emails,、uh, when I say emails in this scenario,、sure. um, they'll they'll tell they'll say something, but they they won't say it directly. Like they won't say it won't be as clear as don't use any distance vector protocols. It'll be something、right. more obscure that leads you to that conclusion, but they'll never say it directly. And if、I、you、see. work in an environment. Where people are not always as forthcoming as they should be, which is really annoying at work, but it can it can benefit you in the test because when you speak to customers in real life, they may not always be straightforward with what they want, not、right. because they're trying to be difficult, but because they simply don't know. Yeah, they're expecting you to figure that out, or just because your manager is sitting next to them and <laughs> they don't want to admit something. You know, maybe because we all solve the problem with the tools that we have at hand, so maybe the person is more familiar with. You know, I don't know distance vector protocol, but obviously, you know something else could could come along and and be a better solution.、Um, so you got to read underneath、uh, between the lines and kind of navigate your、uh, muddy waters, if you will, in that way. Yep, 
That's right. Yeah. So so Nick has a whole book on on this topic. If you're interested, for sure, you should you know go check it out. Um, it's on it's on Lean Pop, right? Uh, well, there's I have two books on Lean Pop. One is um, okay. yeah, one one is the service the CCI service writer book, which is huge and kind oh, of okay. you know somewhat related to this. And then the other book, um, was a, a basically a series of blogs I wrote, which is non technical and just talks about business and investing and kind of some other topics. Um, that's on LeanPub too. That's a kind of a different thing. Um, as it relates to design though, um, I've only done a little bit. I have a couple free CCDE scenarios and some cheat sheets on my website, which we can talk through later. Those yeah. are just free things that people can enjoy. Uh, my friend, Malcolm Budin in, in Scotland, excuse me, he's um, he's going to be doing CCDE training starting next year. So there's a lot of options out there. Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry. I, I thought there was a, a CCD book, but but you're right. Um, it's a, it's a service provider book, but you also offer a ton of free resources, like you said. Um, yeah. If you're interested in IE service provider or you're interested in DE, you know, and of course Nick is uh, always happy to share his opinion on social media and all of that. Um, so before we leave, kind of the technology realm, um, I I wanted to ask, and interesting, you you. You spoke of CCD as there's always one best design, so that kind of mirrors uh, my passion, which is Python, about their uh, idea of there's one best way to do it. There should be one best way to do it, as opposed to you know some other uh, pearl, <laughs> like something else, right? So, um, so I like that. So that I, I thank you for bringing that up because that's a lot of misconception kind of in my head, and you clarified that. So before we leave the technology realm, uh, what are some of the technology that interests you most at this time? You mentioned network automation. I imagine that's one of them, but what else? So it's kind of a weird time for me because, you know, like, you know, obviously through the years I've had different interests that, you know, for the first few years out of the military, it was, you know, routing and switching, enterprise networking. From about 2015 to about 2017, it was service provider and design stuff. From about 2017 until 2020, it was network automation. Um, and now it's kind of like, well, what next? And right. I've been kind of doing all those things. So this year I've been, you know, doing a lot of work for customers. I was on a very difficult uh, customer case for several months this year, which took a lot of time. Um, this year, you know, my the new courses I've done on Pluralsight have been kind of a, a mix of, you know, advanced networking, some multi-vendor automation and hybrid cloud stuff. Um, so it's been kind of a mix of different uh, topics that don't really fit into like a nice category like it used to. Right. So this year I've spent kind of, it's, it's more of a general, like I've, I've achieved expertise in these different areas. And now I really just want to refine that and deliver on it uh, as opposed to like digging into something new. So I, it's hard for me to say I'm kind of in a, kind of in that zone where I was like, okay, you know, I guess I could spend three more months digging more into Python or digging into this or that. Um, but what I'm really enjoying now is taking the more generalist approach and delivering those things for customers within Cisco and writing about them and developing more resources. So it's, it would be hard for me to say that like, I'm really into network automation right now because I just spent yeah. three years doing it. And I'm not sure that my interest is still as high as it was. That doesn't mean I forgot everything. That's not what I'm saying. It's just, I don't, sure. I don't wake up every day playing with new tools like I used to. Right. Um, so it's a little bit different now. Um, and obviously, you know, most of you know that uh, I recently had a, a spine surgery. So that's kind of my top priority for the next six months is making sure I make a full recovery. So my, my, I'm kind of in like a maintenance mode on technical stuff not digging into things as hard as I would normally be doing. Um, yeah. But generally speaking, it's more on, you know, I've been doing a lot of resource to, free resource development, working on, an, I have a new white paper publishing in two months, which is going to be really interesting, which ties yeah. together a lot of the design uh, concepts we talked about. So there's a lot that I'm doing, but it's just harder to categorize because I'm doing a lot of different things, if that makes sense, rather than a lot of things in one category. Yeah, and I think that's great because that's the space that, a lot. I think that's a space that's kind of a void because I know there's a lot of uh, experts out there who goes really deep into, say, OSPF or really deep into BGP. Obviously, Python. There are a ton of experts out there who could talk to talk to you about um, I don't know global lock all day long. But to group them all together into a space that goes back to I think your interest about. Uh, networking that being end to end so you kind of step back and say okay now i've become an expert in all of these individual areas how do i tie them all together so it makes sense to solve real world problem so i definitely look forward to uh, 
what you come up with, right? So this is kind of your fusion period. And you're kind of putting all of these together and trying to come up with something new. Maybe you invent a new language or something just, just for network automation. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, the, the, the thing I'm publishing is just that, you know, I, I write professional white papers a lot. I think it's, you know, that's one thing I think is really lacking in the industry is, you know, people have blogs, like my friend Daniel Deeb has a really great technical blog. Some people sure. have really good blogs. Um, but what you don't see a lot of is like a complete, here's a design I did, you know, I've adapted, I've pulled out the customer information. It's almost like a, like a Cisco CVD, except right. not Cisco and completely free kind of thing. Um, right. So I try to do that in a vendor neutral way. And I try to write one per year on average. So this will, the one I publish will be for, for next year's cause I already wrote one this year. Uh, and those just detail a zero to complete design, which includes all kinds of networking. Usually there's some automation thrown in. Um, and I try to do that because not only does it make me a better writer, and it increases my exposure and influence, but it's also a good indication and it keeps me sharp developing these complex designs um, that allow me to put together all the skills that I've learned. And usually it's based on some real life customer issue, but of course I embellish a little bit when I write these documents. So it's a little bit more interesting uh, and I enjoy <laughs> doing that. Um, it's hard. It takes a lot of work and, but, but you learn a lot from it because you have to set all that stuff up and tie everything together. And I enjoy that a lot. Yeah, I think that's James Clear who uh, who said, or maybe he took that quote from somebody else, but that's who I hear it from. The more you create, the stronger you are, the more you consume, mm. the stronger others would be. And mm. we'll have to find a balance between, you know, creation versus consumption. But uh, but that's something I, I took it to heart as well. The, you know, when in doubt, just go and create something and help one other person to solve their problem. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the world just opens up for you. So I would, you know, definitely recommend people checking out Nick's page. We'll have um, in the show notes on his podcast, on his uh, videos, on his plural site. They're all top notch, like down to the details, right? Like down to the mic. If you're watching the video, you'll see Nick has a um, a good mic with the arm that's in the right depth, and you know the he has his game on the uh, the background too. So so if you took care of all the little things about that, think about you know, the, the actual content that he provides, uh, the script that he wrote out, the logical follow along. So I definitely, you know, encourage people to check it out. And um, yeah, you know, I, I, um, I, I think that's great that you're providing these. Uh, many of them, I would say a lot of them for, for, for free, but also, you know, even if they're not, it's really a bargain for people to pay a uh, monthly subscription for minimum amount of feed and they get all these library on plural sites uh, about all these courses. Yeah, that's the logic. I mean, I try to, I mean, obviously there's, there's, there's a lot of, you know, maybe this is a good way to, to, to kind of transition to the business conversation. Cause we're kind of, right. we're kind of making our way there now. Yes. Um, and it's, it, it's interesting because there are some people <clears throat> and I'm not talking about anyone in particular here, but there are some people <laughs> um, who every time they lift their finger, they want to get paid for it. Right. And then there are other people who do pretty much everything for free. And right. I want to be kind of 80% towards the free side. So almost everything I do, including some very high quality things are free. So my YouTube channel, I have some deep dives on different technologies that I do, walking through different projects. Uh, those videos are take a long time to produce and edit, but those are free. Um, the white papers I just talked about are free. The Postman collections, the packet captures, the job aids, the cheat sheets, all that stuff is completely free. Um, but then I also have courses, live and recorded courses that are that are paid. And the way I look at this is people who want to have... And I hate to I hate to say this, but people who want to experience me and the things I know, I know that sounds kind of cheesy to say, but there's lots of options. You want video? Okay, go to YouTube. You want paid right. video? Go to Pluralsight. You want right. live video? Go to O'Reilly. Or watch this podcast. Or you want other resources? I got those too. Oh, you don't you don't want to watch videos because you like to read? Check out my white papers. You know, like there's there I, I want there to always be options for people. So people who learn different ways or want to consume different things have different ways of consuming it from me. Whether or not that puts money in my pocket is less important than, excuse me, than expanding the influence. Um, and the reason it's not just about power and fame. Yes, those are cool. And I'm not going to lie. I like having those things, but I like having those things because they allow me to use my influence in the service of improving technology and the people who serve in that space. So again, if I, if I, I'll be honest, if I just wanted to like get super rich, I would write a bunch of books. 
I would charge a bunch of money. Like I made a, I made a, a good amount of money on my service provider book because it was the only offering for like a year. Um, right. I would do things like that. And that's all I would do. And you wouldn't be talking to me right now because I would be retired. Uh, that would be <laughs> a very different, a di different strategy of only right. doing things where you get paid or doing free things where you point people to your paid stuff. And that's all you do. And there's nothing wrong. I want to be clear. There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. People should be paid for the work that they do. Yes. But at the same time, I like to do things for free because, you know, if I were to charge money for the white papers and the postman collections, hardly anyone would use it. And what, what good is that? I spent all this right. time building this thing and okay, I made 500 bucks selling it, but like now 10 people use it instead of 10,000, you know, like why, well, how is that helpful? So I try to be, I try to be smart and I've had this conversation with someone actually a, a relatively young a woman in tech. We, mm -hmm. we had a chat over Twitter and she was wanting to know how can I differentiate between what should be paid and what should not be paid. Right. And my logic was the things that should be free should be the things that other people can do, even if they don't. So for example, other people can make cheat sheets. Other people can write white papers. Other people can make YouTube videos and other people can go on podcasts. But things that other people either can't do or won't do because it's really hard are yeah. making a three hour course with you know meticulously edited and produced or Talking, standing here for four hours, like, a, you know, imagine me standing here and talking with this level of intensity for four hours about Python or Ansible or network DevOps or, or using Python requests and interfacing with REST APIs. Those are the four courses I have on O'Reilly. That mm -hmm. takes a lot of effort. And there are people who can't do that to a satisfactory degree. And those are the things I decide to, to charge money for. Um, and that's just kind of a general, you know, when I, when I think about like, should this be free or should this be paid? That's usually how I, how I kind of turn it over in my mind is is this something that's really differentiated or is everyone doing this and i'm just another voice because if i'm just another voice there's a good chance i can't command any money for it right so building that that tribe and you mentioned um the percentage of, of things that you give out for free and for pay and your philosophy in a differentiating between the two um i think it was gary v who uh, kind of is always uh a proponent about this long game, right? Like the things that he gave out for free are so good that other people charge money for it. And in the long run, he actually benefited him a whole bunch for um, just his influence and he building a tribe and and it's it's a marathon rather than people who is making a quick $500 for the white paper, but you're giving it for free, yet, but you know, you you increase your influence, you you increase your trustworthiness and you're building a bond between somebody asynchronously and which is what i like about writing is it's almost you have the superpower right you wrote something two years ago but somebody reading it now is as if you're sitting there talking to them through words on what your thought process are and um, kind of your uh your background and your learning style yeah no i, I agree with that and there's Again, I, I've, I've experimented with a lot of things, everything from, you know, blogging, YouTube, white papers, resources, video courses, live courses. So I've done I've done pretty much all those things. Um, and there are some I like more than others. Some are more profitable than others. Um, right. Again, but that depends entirely on what you're after. You know, so I, I think we talk about this later, but I think now's a good time is, you know, there are different kinds of value. And I think that people, I think people in, inherently know this but it's not always easy to put in words. You know, there's a, there's functional value. Like, does this thing actually help me do something or not? Uh, there's social value. There's psychological value. Like even think about a pair of shoes or a yeah. pair of boots. Like there's obviously, there's a functional value to boots, but depending on the type of boot, there could be a social value. There could be a psychological value of people feeling bigger or stronger, or if there's some special kind of, you know, whatever, you know, this goes for pickup trucks. It goes for pretty much everything that you can buy. And I have decided, you know, when I would, when I was setting up my business three and a half years ago yeah, and I was deciding what are going to be the core values that govern my business, what is the kind of value I want to bring to people? I decided that I wanted to mostly be a functional value proposition. And mm -hmm. the reason for that is because there are other people who are a lot more extroverted. There are people who are just more funny, more entertaining than I am, who are better suited to capture people who want social and psychological value. Yeah. So a few examples, um, you know, on, on YouTube, 
my YouTube channel performs horribly. Like I can't <laughs> even meet the threshold to get paid for the ads that YouTube forces on my videos. Right. So it okay. makes me upset. Like a little okay. bit. I'm not like super mad, but I'm a little sure. bit upset about that. Sure. Um, my videos perform very poorly. And it's not that the videos are bad. Like they're, they're well edited. Um, I think that the content is good and they're on par with my Pluralsight courses, which are very popular. So right. why is YouTube performing poorly? Because yeah. YouTube is television. That's right. I mean, to, to, when I say the word tube, it's television for you. And when people go to YouTube, it's almost like, and I'm not trying to uh, complain here, but it, they, they want a mix of information and entertainment. They want infotainment. And I'm right. just not good at that. Mm -hmm. You know, I could never be a, a, I could never have a cable news show. I'm just yeah. not that kind of guy. Right. And other people are absolutely excellent at doing that. They have huge followings. They give out a mix of technical information combined with entertainment and in come the, the hundred thousand views every week. And that's mm -hmm. great. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this out of envy. I've, I'm legitimately happy for them, but I know that I can't compete in that space because I just don't have the personality for it. So instead I, I go for the, I go for the meat and potatoes approach, right? Technical information that's unique and different and delivered in a variety of ways. And mm -hmm. it's going to, that's going to attract a different audience. And right. it's just like, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, like cars and people, you know, I'll see someone in a sports car and, you know, I drive a 2008 Kia and I love <laughs> it. Right. And that's not changing. Right. So I see someone driving, you know, a, a $60,000, $60,000 Audi or a $90,000, you know, Ford F350. And I'm thinking like, never, I would never do that. But those, those cars weren't made for me. Like Ford and their, their C-suite was not sitting in Detroit being like, how can we sell Nick Russo a Ford F-350? It's not happening. But other people <laughs> like it. Yeah. But for whatever reason, functional, social, or psychological, they like that. Same thing with sports cars. Same thing with everything from tattoos to you name it. There's a market for those things. But I know that I can't do that. And one of the, and where I'm really going with this, is not just some, some, some silly rant where I'm going with this. And this is probably the best advice I can give is you have to be authentic. If you're not the kind of person who's going to wear a t-shirt that says, you know, I'm a tech guy. Like I, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing a shirt like that. I just don't like wearing tech apparel. It's kind of silly to me, but some people are really into that. They sell merchandise. I would never do that. That's right. why I don't. Um, you need to be authentic and you need to ensure that the services and the products that you offer are an actual reflection of you and your values because people can see through the fakeness. Yeah. And if you try to con people, you can't do it for very long. So you need to be yourself. And if you're a meat and potatoes guy who likes to work with tech and you're short with your words and you want to get straight to the point, then you need to compete in that space. Don't start selling hoodies and coffee mugs because it's probably not going to work for you. So it's important that your strategy aligns with what you are specifically with what is aligned with your personal ethics and your personal beliefs and your personal brand and the things that interest you and not just saying, Oh, I could make another hundred bucks a month by selling this, this, you know, widget on my site. Maybe that's true, but then that just comes across as kind of unauthentic and you never want to be seen as that. Yeah. But if you are someone who has a huge following on YouTube or Instagram and you are known for being someone who delivers excellent psychological value, then you absolutely could do those things. And you should do that. Honestly, you should. If I were good at that, I wish I were good at that because I'd be doing it too, but I'm not. And I know that I'm not. Um, but if you are good at those things, you want to capitalize on your strengths. And I think someone who does this exceptionally well is Network Chuck. He mm has -hmm. a huge following. Yes. He looks good. He's got a cool beard. His videos are really interesting. They attract a lot of viewers and he can do all this stuff. I wish I could. I really wish I could, but he's great at that. He dominates that space. Yeah. And he's, he's honestly brilliant because he knew that when he set out to do that, he knew what he was good at. He was able to, to assemble all those different things together, attract a big audience and grow his influence while still being authentic. Like that's brilliant. Like I, I think that's, it was absolutely perfect execution on his part. And there are many others who do it well. Um, but I think Network Chuck is just a good example of someone who really understands how to deliver value for the people who are into the same things that he is while also being himself. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point because people like Network Chuck and David Bumble, those are mm -hmm. two types of people who really, and of course, Daniel, as you mentioned, these are people who know themselves and they kind of 
um, they kind of gear toward their strength, like you have done, right. and um, and they're they're all like, but regardless of your tool set, regardless of um, your approach or your your platform or your media, one thing all of you have in common is being authentic and knowing your strength. So you know, if I were to kind of summarize what you just said, is to create your own space, you have to know your strength and gear toward it. Um, but those are tall orders, right? Like those are those are the the, the million dollar question. Like, how yeah. do you find your strength, and how do you know what you're good at? Which platforms for you? Yeah, you need to experiment. Um, you know, a few examples. Like on YouTube, I initially was using YouTube as a way just to make videos to document things I did. So, recording a talk I gave at Interop, um, talking about, hey, here's how I built my website. It was kind of cool. Like I didn't expect to get a million views on that, and I didn't. Um, over the summer, you know, an experiment that honestly kind of failed is I recorded a 12 part uh, series on BGP multi-homing and I thought mm -hmm. for sure people were going to like this I mean, they didn't. And that's fine. I'm not mad, but it just kind of shows that YouTube is not a place where I can compete. It's just yeah. not, I just yeah. don't have it. So I'm not going to be doing a lot on YouTube. Well, occasionally I might put out a thing or two, but I'm not going to try. I'm not going to force it. I'm not going to square peg round hole the YouTube thing. Um, another example. So that's a failure. And I know that. So I, you know, do I, you know, a year ago, am I strong at YouTube? Yes or no? Question mark. I don't know. But now I do. Now the answer is definitely no. Um, mm. A few years ago, I had resisted uh, setting up a blog because I always suspected that I wouldn't, wouldn't be very good at it. Even if the, even if the content was good and I were happy with it and people who reviewed it enjoyed it. I never really thought that it would take off the way that Daniel Deeb and, and Amy engineer and other well-known bloggers have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wrote 50 blogs for a year, once a week. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got a little bit of traffic, not much, very little actually, uh, recorded it into an audiobook, produced it, um, published it on lean pub for the, the lowest cost I could sell it for, which was four 99. <laughs> it was a total commercial flop. I Complete see. Flop. I think I sold 30 copies. So imagine writing a book for $150 before tax, you know, like totally not worth it. Now, it, I mean, it was worth it because I learned a lot. Like I learned an extremely valuable lesson is that no one cares about Nick Russo's blogs. And I wasn't <laughs> mad because I yeah. learned something. And right. that's why I haven't written another blog in three years because it's not going to work. So I've focused on the things that will work instead. Um, and this is what people need to do. Like it, you can't just show up and be like, I'm going to be this great blogger. and I'm going to sell these coffee mugs and then I'm going to do all this stuff. It's like, you don't even know if you're good at that stuff yet. So you need to experiment, figure out what you are good at figure out what people are willing to pay for in conjunction with the kind of value that you are capable of bringing while at the same time, making sure that you remain authentic. So you're right that it is a tall order, but the only way you're going to know is by conducting those experiments and seeing what works. And you also need to be mature enough to abandon things that don't work unless you really like it. Like if I really loved blogging and I didn't care at all about people reading them, then I would just keep doing it. But if it's, you know, something you're actually looking to, you know, gain influence through or make money through, you need to be honest with yourself and step back if something's not working. Yeah. So got it. So when, when you don't know, um, this is probably something that you would give advice to people who want to get started is just to kind of experiment, like you'll try out a few YouTube videos, write your blog and maybe publish something, um, on written media, then you could see whether you you like it or not and whether you have any kind of success and of course whether that meets your that kind of feeds off each other right like you, you have more success and that feeds into your motivation that you want to do it more so you want to find those two if you imagine like two circles one is what you're good at and what people will pay you for you kind of want to find that that sweet spot where the two circles overlap that's right yeah it's absolutely right and the only way to really know is by you know by, by doing those experiments um, yes, you know, the, sometimes those experiments are going to take time. I mean, recording 12 videos, each of which was six minutes long and building labs and configs for each one, like that took a long time. Yeah. Um, took, it, it was, you know, if I had turned that into a Pluralsight course, yeah. I probably could have sold it for, let's say over three years, I probably would have made $8,000. So right. would have, would have done okay. I'll, I'll make zero on it now, but mm -hmm. I needed to conduct the experiment to know is YouTube a place where I can compete? And it's right. really not because the things that you need to do to be popular on YouTube aren't intrinsic in me as a person. 
Like I just don't have that personality and I'm okay. I'm not mad at people who are good at it. I'm happy that other people can, can capture that value because I can't do it, but right. I can do other things and I'm going to focus on doing those things. And it takes time. And again, it takes time, it takes knowing yourself and it takes experience and experiments to, to get to that point. So I think I've beat, I think I've beaten the horse pretty good there, but <laughs> no, no. completely clear with everyone about those things. Yeah, no, it's, it's perfect. Right. Because this is, this is great. So I think the million dollar question that people will have on their mind, which is even when in the beginning of the show, we mentioned, you know, you're doing all these other stuff and I, you, you know, you, you did Pluralsight, there's uh, O'Reilly Media, uh, you know, synchronous courses that you do, you publish books, you do YouTube. At the same time, you actually work full time at Cisco and do, working on these, you know, difficult customer cases. So here's, you know, everybody, the question on everybody's mind is how do you find the time? What's the challenge and how, how do you how do you do it basically time wise? Yeah, the, the the number one tip I have for this, I mean, there are lots of you know time management and getting things done and books and all kinds of things on time management. But there's really, I guess, two things that I would recommend. Is the first yeah. is stop watching television. Or if you, <laughs> if, if you can't, like if there's some show that you really like, just severely moderate your television. Um, I learned, I was actually kind of upset with myself because after I had surgery, I was in bed for most of the day and only getting up to walk, you know, occasionally for the first few days. And when you're stuck in bed all day, what do you do? You're on your phone. Yeah. And my screen time was up to about eight to nine hours a day, oh, which wow. is just, for me, that's just disgusting. That's just a ridiculous <laughs> amount of time to spend on your phone. Now I would never do that outside of that medical circumstance. Right. Um, but when you're, you know, I'm watching YouTube, I'm watching all kinds, you know, cause YouTube is TV. It's addicting. I'm watching strongman competitions. I'm watching like all kinds of craziness. Like it's moderately entertaining, but that's all it is. It's entertainment. So yeah. don't waste time like that. It's so easy to get sucked in. The second thing is do the most important thing first. So mm -hmm. when I wake up in the morning after I do my, you know, basic morning routine, brush teeth, you know, that kind of thing. Five, 10 minutes later, I'm doing whatever the most important thing that day is. If I have an active contract with Pluralsight, which I don't right now, but if I did, I record every morning mm -hmm. for only, only for 30 or 45 minutes. Cause you know, once you, once you've been talking for more than an hour, your voice starts to get raspy. You know, I get sick of standing here. Right. And that frustration comes out of my voice, right. even though it doesn't, it's, it's hard to tell. I can feel it and other people can feel it too. Right. So I only record for short periods of time while I'm fresh and while my voice is uh, nice and mellow. And then I go about my day yeah. um, when I don't have a, you know, if I'm not recording, I'll, I'll build content. Uh, if I'm working on a white paper, that'll be the first thing I do after my back surgery. The first thing I did every morning was go for a walk because that was the most important thing at that point. So mm -hmm. whatever the most important thing is, whether it's technical or not, do that first for the first 30 to 60 minutes every day before you do anything. Don't check emails. Don't check Twitter. Don't do anything other than your basic, you know, biological routine plus that for up to an hour, then yeah. start your day. Nothing, yeah. with work, nothing with your full-time job, all that stuff can wait. Um, because in that hour, you're going to be at your best. You're going to be, well, at least I am now again, if you're not a morning person, maybe this is bad advice, but if you're, <laughs> if you're someone who can, who can wake up and be functional and doesn't yeah. need, you know, doesn't need to wait three hours for the coffee to kick in. I find that waking, rolling out of bed, doing the most important stuff early allows me to put, you know, the, basically the maximum amount of focus into that. And I can get a ton of work done in that period. And then through the rest of the day, uh, I'm able to apply, you know, 80% effort, which is more yeah. than enough to, to do my job well, uh, and also handle other things. And then in the evenings, if I have time, that's when I do my low, my low important tasks, filling out a new W9 because I started a new company, you know, oh, sending okay. emails to suppliers, scheduling courses, things that aren't hard. You know, things that take time, I'll do those at the end of the day when I'm tired and I don't need to think. I just need to put dates on a calendar, you know, answering emails. I'll do that yeah. last. Yeah, so I, I would totally agree with that. So, of course, you mentioned this, but I also want to bring it up because um, I think it's a book called Why We Sleep. So, you know, it actually goes into the scientific terms about uh, there are people who are morning person and people who are just naturally gravitate toward being a night owl. But what you said is equally applicable to people who are morning people or uh, who are night owls is, you know, do the most important thing first. You'll feel more calm. You're, you're um, 
you're at your best at being the most, you know, it goes back into the uh, 2080 rule, right? Like you're, you're spending the best hour of your day on the 80% that produces the most. W would that be an accurate description of what you said? I think so. Um, you know, yeah, you spend, you spend a short amount of time working on the most important tasks. And I know it just sounds obvious to say that, but humans are weird. You know, if we were machines, it wouldn't be a problem, but we procrastinate. Sometimes we put things off. Sometimes we wake up and we do the lowest priority things first, like answering emails and scheduling. I mean, it's so easy to roll out of bed, check your social media and check your emails. Like I was, I still do that on occasion because it's such a hard habit to break. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, when, I, when things are really serious, like before I had surgery, I wanted to finish my, my MPLS course at Pluralsight, mm -hmm. which managed to pull off like a day or two before. And right. it was an extreme effort because I wasn't, I was hurting, like physically hurting. So it was hard. Like it was physically hard to do. And it was mentally hard because I had, you know, to record and edit three hours worth of stuff. And even though I had built all the content and the transcripts, I still had to rehearse it, record it, edit. That was geez, I don't know, 50 hours of work in a week while yeah. working full time. So it was like a hundred hour week. It was a really tough time, um, right. but I did get it done. And then I was able to relax through my recovery uh, without having to stress about it. And, yeah. but you know, when I was going through that, I went into that mode where it's like, Hey, the phone, you know, when I go to sleep, my phone is on airplane and it doesn't come off airplane until I unplug my mic and I'm done recording. Then I'll check emails and eat breakfast and do all that other stuff. So I even, I even push breakfast you know, past all this stuff. Like I'll, I'll be working, I'll be hungry. I was like, nope, let me get through this. Then after that, I can go relax. I can go eat. I can, you know, at that point I can take a 20 minute break and feel, and not feel guilty about it. Right. Right. No, I, I concur with that. So like you, you know, whenever I have something under contract, whether it's a book, whether it's something I want to publish a course, I do that first too. And I will force myself to, for example, write about a thousand words per day. And it doesn't really matter whether I throw away those or not. But at the end of the day, um, whenever I, I, the interesting thing is whenever I, I do that, I find myself more calm afterwards and I am better with the kids. I'm better with my wife. I'm just a better person because, you know, I kind of cross, I check that off the list. And for the rest of the day, I know I've done something that gears toward that really brings value and propels forward as opposed to, like you said, checking emails or checking the social media booking stuff that doesn't require me to be at my best to do this. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I, you know, there's, there's something very satisfying about checking the box. You know, like I have a Kanban board I've talked about, you know, I move a card to done or if it's a, if it's a card with a checklist, I check an item. Like I checked yeah. off three this morning for some just minor tasks and cleanup that I'm doing. I felt great. Um, even before that, I had a little physical notepad where I would check things off and that felt good too. Um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, something I read in one of his books. And this is something that I do. You know, I don't do this in the gym, but I do this at home is mm -hmm. I have a tally. Every time I finish a set, I have a little paper and I make a tally and making the tally feels good. Uh, and he does that in the gym. He's like, every time I'm done, I'm, you know, recording that I did it. And then when you make that final tally, you feel great. And now you feel like you've earned the right to go home. And it, it, it's a, it's a really powerful mental thing is that you're keeping track of the work that you're doing. And when you complete it, you know, along the way, you get some satisfaction each time and it makes you feel like you've done something. Um, yeah. And I think that having that record, like you said, I'm the same. I'm better with the wife. I'm better with the kids. I just feel better um, knowing that that got done. And even if I don't get as much done as I wanted, well, hey, I checked three boxes out of seven. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit behind, but my back hurts. You know, I just had surgery. <laughs> that's, oh, that's, yeah. been, that's, that's just how it is. Um, right. But uh, it's it's the it's the fact that you did that and recorded it. And that makes a huge difference. And especially if you're in a, a, a time crunch or you're doing, trying to do any kind of time management, that progress is going to ultimately lead to something really useful. Like when you finish your book, you finish your course or whatever. Um, that's extremely helpful. You know, I've worked with other uh, authors at Pluralsight and other companies who really struggle with deadlines because, you know, they come up with this grand plan in the beginning, but they don't really do a good job of tracking their progress. And they're not really kind to themselves. Like me checking off items, I do that for me because it makes me feel good. It's not a lie. Like I'm not, I'm not making up fake tasks just to check them off. Like it's, it's the truth. I'm actually making progress and I want to acknowledge that I've done that because it makes me feel better. And there's nothing wrong with feeling better about getting things done, right? That's my logic. As long as I'm getting yeah. things done and why not? Uh, so that helps me, that helps me to move things forward and just keep, keeps my mental state a little better. Cause I've, you know, I've been under extreme pressure 
from I'm sure you have too at points, you know, for timelines or you're trying to finish something and it's really hard and you can't figure out how to do, you know, you can't figure out, uh, you know, async IO in Python. It's really hard and you have to write about it in your book. Uh, and you, you feel like you barely understand it yourself and now you have to write about it. You know, I'm sure you've encountered things like that in the Python world a million times, but guess what? You need to come up with a plan and when you have the plan, check it off as you go and you're going to feel better. That's just how it is. I think Nick, you have to come back on the show so we could compare notes on tools and the things <laughs> that we tried and doesn't work, whether it's a Kanban board or it's a Trello board or time management, all of these tools that you know, habit building, um, those are those would be super interesting. And I would be, I think helpful to a lot of people because even if you just adapt one tool, like you said, your Kanban board and checking off those psychological benefit will really help a lot of people to move further. I mean, you don't have to go a mile a day, but you know, that's that's the whole point you're talking about, right? You don't have to go a mile a day. You just have to trend in the right direction. Right. Yeah. Make make some progress every day. And I, I honestly think you'll be surprised at how soon you finish. So long as you're consistent every day. Um, if you work for, if you only can do 30 minutes a day, you know, if you have, a, let's say you have a three hour plural site course and that three, and that's going to take you a hundred hours to finish. Right. If you do, I mean, 30 minutes a day is probably not going to be enough, but if you did a couple hours a day, you'd finish it in a, in a couple months. And that would totally be within the parameters of the deadline that would be set. Um, and that's, and that's really what it takes. Um, but you have to be consistent. If you take a week off, you're going to put yourself in jeopardy. If you take three weeks off, there's no chance you'll finish, um, especially because you'll have to start up again. So definitely, uh, yeah, we can definitely talk tools. Um, I'm not like a crazy tool guy. I'm a pretty simple guy, but I think that so long as you are tracking your progress and you are giving yourself that, that occasional brain candy, that psychological benefit, combining those two things together, like, real good objective measurements plus a little bit of self-satisfaction that will really go a long way to keeping you on track. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So Nick, how can people, I think, you know, before we go, I want to just kind of ask a few more questions. So how can people get started um, with your material? Like where would you recommend people? Uh, because you publish a wide array of, you know, expert level, intermediate, and as well as beginner level contents how can people get started to you know say network automation service provider how would they do about you know just consuming your content in general um yeah so i, I guess there's a couple aspects so in terms of like being a consumer because i'll talk about yes. creating and consuming yeah so about, sure. on the consuming topic um i tell everyone start like i also in addition to expanding influence i see free resources as a good way for people to sample whether they like you and your style or not. So <clears throat> I'm not better than Network Chuck and he's not better than me. We're different. We appeal to different people. We bring different types of value. We use different platforms. We don't even look the same, right? Watch his videos and then watch, either watch or read the things that I've done. And then you'll determine, you know, and you could, you may like both of us. You may like neither. You may like one or the other. It really just depends. But my point is this, check out the free things that I've done. Read the, if you're into network design, read the white papers. If you're into automation, check out the, some of the Postman collections. Like, you know, you see my website, all those things are very, um, you know, my website's super simple. Everything is two clicks away, so you can find what you need. Um, it'll be very obvious what's paid and what's not. Um, just click around and see what you like. And if you like what you see, then you can consume more if you like. There's service provider stuff, there's design stuff, whatever. Um, no reg wall, there's nothing you have to... Uh, you know, there's no signups. There's no mail list. Just, just take whatever you want. I don't, I don't, yeah, I'm a simple guy. Um, nice. but in terms of creating, and this is where I think the interesting thing happens is I talked about this earlier is that you need to have a strategy first. You mm -hmm. need to be very clear about what you are going to do and what you're not going to do. And being clear on what you're not going to do is equally important. And when I first started off, what I didn't want, to, the work that I didn't want to do was going to be kind of, um, you know, the, the turnkey level stuff, like, you know, t uh, teach me about subnetting and things like that. Like lots of, that's an important topic, but lots of people can teach it. Lots of people already do teach it. And the people who do have enormous brands. Well, why would I compete with that? I have right. other skills that I think I can bring that are going to be more useful. So uh, you have to be clear about what you want to do and what you don't want to do. 
And one of the big things in my strategy or one of my values was I want to win without competing. And it doesn't mean through bribery, but it means through <laughs> being so good at what you do that people ask you to do business with them rather than you proposing. And a lot of people, sometimes we call this word of mouth, where rather than, you know, talking about your business through the traditional channels, you find a few people who really trust you and those people bring you more business than you can handle. And I know plenty of consultants who are in that situation. Um, as it relates to Pluralsight, it's a good example. A lot of the network automation content there, I did. I wrote proposals for it because I had to, but not to win business, just to, just to get a contract. Because they asked me to do those things because they knew I could do it. They knew I could do a good job on time and in budget. And I delivered on that promise like 15 times. So mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're super happy about that. Um, I didn't have to compete for that business. Right. And when you have to compete for the business, everyone is going to have to put in proposals. Only one gets picked. And then the other N minus one people are upset. Why, why would you want to, why would you want to do that? Just find something else that you know, you can do well in where you won't have to make a proposal to some executive editor who's going to turn you down and win business because you've carved out a space for yourself that other people either can't or on, or are unwilling to compete. So I know other people have looked to differentiate themselves similarly, and some have succeeded and some have not, but it's important that you at least try, because if you have to constantly compete for everything you do, you're going to lose a substantial amount. And that's going to take time because writing a proposal is not always easy. And if you lose all that time you put into it, it's for nothing. So you want to try to avoid that. Yeah, I think that that runs in the theme of throughout our conversation is, you know, when you approach, you're always being very mindful about approaching a project. You have a goal, you have a strategy to move forward, and it either works out or you learn something from it. That seems to be the way that you approach stuff, whether it's a YouTube channel, whether that's your blog, whether that's your website. You know, we, we, I know we talked about you're not going to win any designed uh, awards for your website, but it certainly is useful. It's jam packed with information. It's simple, two clicks away, like you said, and um, it's it's really awesome. So so I thank you for for bringing that up. Uh, of course, you know, you can always check out other resources on uh, his website and go deeper into those. Like you said, like Nick said, there's you know, not nothing is two, more than two clicks away. So. I mean, it's been a, a very delightful conversation, but we're coming up out of that. I feel like we could talk for another hour or so, but um, I want to respect your time and I want to respect our audience time. So before we say goodbye, Nick, so where can people find you if they want to get in touch? So uh, there's my website there, njrusmc.net. That's probably, that's where all my whole body of work is there. So you can, you can go there. Uh, and then my Twitter is uh, Nick Russo 42518 and if you go to click on about me and scroll down uh, that first link there, you'll see, yeah, if you scroll down, you'll see the contact me. So email, Twitter, all that stuff oh, nice. is there. Okay. Yeah. I try to make it easy. So there it is. Um, so you can, you can check that out. If you want to reach me on Twitter, I spend some time there. They're trying not to spend too much time, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So, 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 so I'm on Twitter, um, other social media, GitHub, LinkedIn, you can reach me on those places too, but probably Twitter and through my website are the best ways. Okay. So we talked about how to get started. Um, how any call to action there, Nick, on for people who are who want to get started, whether it's on the consumer side or whether it's on the producer side. Any call to action? Yeah, the consumer side is as simple as check out people. You know, people that your friends and colleagues are talking about. Check out some of their free content. Uh, most of them will have something for free, whether it's on YouTube or in written form. Check that out and determine if they are delivering the kind of value that you're looking for, functional, social, or psychological. Um, for producers, I would recommend uh, Patrick Lencioni. I think he has some really good books. They're short. They're fun. Um, I've, I think I've read pretty much all of his books. Um, everything you see here, I've read multiple times. Um, mm -hmm. In the bottom left, The Advantage. That book is specific about developing a strategy for consultants. So that is an exceptionally good book if you are trying to uh, determine what are your core values for your company? What is the kind of value you want to deliver? What's your mission statement? How do you come up with those things? So this is this is a good book uh, for that. Um, and there's a, there's a there's like ten other books that go into different aspects of it. So I'd recommend those. They're they're again they're easy, they're fun, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, yeah, yeah. The the last thing I'll say is 
I, I once learned from a, from a woman, she said, she observes how men treat their mothers and their sisters, because that's usually a good indication of how they treat women in general. And I'm not saying this, you know, to bring up a, a man woman conversation. <laughs> but my point on this is just being ethical. And I know that I had talked about ethics a week ago and I don't want to get too much into it here. Sure. Um, but you know, if you treat, if you, if, if you do business with multiple people, and I don't just mean customers, you know, if you, if you treat your suppliers different than you treat customers and you treat your partners different than you treat your suppliers. And if you're nicer and more respectful to certain people, and if you're more forthcoming with certain people than others, I would consider that to be unethical. So just as a general comment, I talked about this for like an hour and change a week ago in a Twitter space, but just to summarize on this, don't look at ethics as just a matter of being compliant with the law or your employer. Because if you find yourself saying things like, well, it's technically legal, you're probably doing something unethical. Like if you have to <laughs> rationalize your activity based on the letter of the law and nothing past it, you're probably acting unethically. So step back and just make sure that as you do everything I talked about, developing a strategy, building relationships, expanding your brand, determining the type of value, being authentic, just make sure that when you're doing all those things, you're not just considering, you know, is my employer, has my employer approved what I'm doing? But in addition, am I actually acting ethically in everything that I do? And I know that sounds very trite and it sounds like a platitude, um, but it's important. And I have, count, you know, I told it on my Twitter space, countless stories of how my own personal ethical behavior managed to have direct business benefits for me. Um, and instead of being a hindrance, it was actually a benefit. Um, and if I had acted differently, you know, here's a good example. I, I acted unethically yesterday um, on a very small topic. Uh, we had to do with a company and tax forms and they were giving me a hard time about it. And I said some things that were not very nice. And they came back and said, hey, we fixed all your problems. Don't worry about it. Uh, we, we took care of it for you. You don't have to go and send it again. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, you know, like, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I really, I shouldn't have reacted like that. Um, we, we probably could have worked this out differently. Now, you might be thinking that's not so much of an ethical transgression as me just being impertinent, which it was. Mm -hmm. But if I had actually acted in accordance with my own values, I wouldn't have done that. So it's a kind of a good example of recently where I failed to live up to my own expectations. And even though I ended up getting what I needed at the end, it never had to come to that. And now imagine if it had gone the other way where they just refused to talk to me. The business would have been gone. They'd pay me my $500 and we would never transact anything again. Mm -hmm. Foolish. That's why right. acting ethically is important. Right, right. Wow, that's that's pretty, that's good stuff. So I'm not very familiar with Twitter space at this time. So are those recorded or are you? Are they're they just not. It, it's like Clubhouse for Twitter, basically. <laughs> um, I think they they record it and then they hold it in a, you know, in the background for a few weeks just to make sure if there's any, you know, laws or, you know, what, whatever, you know, Twitter will probably, you know, if there's like harassment or something, then they can mm -hmm. have a record. But I think mm -hmm. it gets deleted after a few weeks and it's not made public. So it's only okay. recorded for okay. compliance reasons. But yeah, they're not recorded. Um, I like that because I, I tend to be a little bit unplugged in those. Um, yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a really profane guy in general, but I might let a word or two slip and I'm usually better about that on podcasts. But <laughs> those conversations are a little more, they're a little more personal. Um, I go through multi, like the story I just told. Imagine yeah. that, but. 15 more. Um, right. So I go through all those examples and some end better than others. And sometimes I behave better than I do, like I just described. Um, but I try to give those examples so people can see, here's an example of being ethical and here's an example of not. And here are the business benefits of actually being ethical. It actually doesn't cost you anything. It's a gain. Um, but again, that's a conversation for another day. But I wanted to make <laughs> sure we wrap up on that because when you become blinded by power and fame and influence and making money, it's very easy to shortcut those things. Um, but they are, but they're extremely important. Yeah, for sure. So unfortunately they're not recorded, but if you want more content in that regard, I'm sure, you know, you could let, you know, Nick know in via Twitter, via email, and I'm sure he'll have, you know, something out just the way that he works. <laughs> but of course, you know, uh, Keep in touch, uh, following Nick on his uh, Twitter handle, and he will announce the next, uh, you know, Twitter space or whatnot, as well as his other contents. So I want to thank you again, Nick, for being on the show. Uh, I really appreciate our conversation. Like I said, I have a, 
a rain check for us to discuss tools and kind of this mindsets, habit building, because I think that's going to be another interesting uh, conversation. Cool. Well, thanks, Eric, for having me on. It's always my pleasure. And hopefully the, uh, uh, the listeners all enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks. So you've been listening to Network Automation Nerds podcast today. We talked to Nick Russo on a range of topics. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other major podcast platforms. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you.